Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Scale Modeling Channel. Today we're going to start a four-part series on building the old Renwall 1 to 200 scale nuclear powered submarine with a full interior. A few years ago I did a video on the different versions of this kit that were issued by Renwall and the Revell counterpart which was a slightly smaller scale. So I've built the kit took a few months to do and I've got a four part series and part one is going to go a little slow because I'm going to show you how to clean up some of the small intricate parts and especially how I hold an exacto number 11 blade when I clean the parts up. So with that short introduction let's get started. Test fitting the parts is an important step in building any model and this 1 to 200 scale sub is no different. The vertical bulkheads and the aft deck sections cleaned up pretty quickly and they all fit nice and tight in their locations in the aft part of the sub. The long deck sections for the missile silos as well as the two bulkheads also cleaned up quite nicely and they fit very well inside of their respective locations. However, the upper deck section had a slight bow in it and the center deck section had a slight twist. Both of these are going to need to be corrected. The forward vertical bulkheads as well as the multiple decks in this area also cleaned up quickly and they fit very well in their respective locations and there were no twists either in the bulkheads or the decks. The tree attachment points on this old kit are pretty thick so I used both a pair of snippers and a pair of plastic cutters to remove the parts. Notice how I'm trying to leave a little bit of the tree stub onto the parts, which I'll clean up later. This helps guarantee that the edges of the parts won't be damaged as they're being cut off. Notice how I'm moving the tree around so that I can properly position the cutters and remove the parts without damaging them. I'm also going to start speeding up the video here so that uh, we'll save a little bit of time. The attachment points for the propeller are pretty thick and the propeller blades are pretty thin. So I use the snipper to remove the tree part from the blade attachment and then the cutters to remove the larger section which is attached to the base of the propeller. And now it's time to start cleaning up the individual parts. I like to use a small wood block as a pedestal to remove any excess stubs that are on the individual parts. This helps ensure that the parts won't get damaged. Notice how I'm manipulating the number 11 X-Acto blade to get rid of any excess plastic on the individual parts. Holding it at a slight angle helps ensure that the blade won't gouge the plastic. Here I'm using a sanding stick to sand down the seam line across this part and also reshape it. Notice how I'm manipulating both the part, the sanding stick, and the number 11 X-Acto blade in order to reshape this part so it'll look good. Notice the extreme angle that I'm using on the number 11 X-Acto blade to remove the remaining stubs off of this part. Here again, I'm manipulating the positioning of the blade against the part in order to remove the stubs and clean it up. This part had some mold seam lines that uh, needed to be removed in order to reshape it. I checked one of my original issue kits on this from Renoir from the 1960s and I checked the individual parts and I noticed that there wasn't much difference in the size of the mold seam lines. So these molds have held up really, really well over the past 70 years. This two-part assembly had positioning tabs that misaligned the upper and lower parts, but once I removed the positioning tabs, it fit together much better.
You have to be real careful when cleaning up the propeller because the blades are thin and fragile. I'm manipulating the tip of the blade an awful lot here in order to clean up the mold lines in between the propeller blades at the base. Notice how I'm holding both the part and the blade as I carefully scrape off the mold lines from all of the piping. There's a lot more parts to this kit and they all clean up using the same methods that I demonstrated on the parts associated with this one tree. I'm sorry about the odd lighting in this segment of the video. I forgot to change the camera from natural light to incandescent light on my workbench. And I promise it won't happen again for all the rest of the videos on all four parts. In the last part of this video in part one, I'm going to talk about the modifications that I made to the individual parts. So we'll start with the uh, ballistic missile tubes. They actually fit together fairly well and even the reinforcing rings line up nicely. So how I glued these together was I checked the edges and the edges were rather clean. Put a thin piece of tape here and here, got them tightly to tightly fit together and then put a few drops of super glue on the seam lines on the inside to hold them. And then uh, once they were dry, I removed the tape and then I ran super glue on the outside a thin bead along each of the seam lines here and I sanded the ridges off of the seam off of the super glue and then scraped it smooth checked it with silver paint fixed any flaws that I found repeated that process and then I used uh, a, a flexophile and I wet sanded the surface smooth and got rid of any ridges from the scraping and restored the nice round shape there are 16 of these um, missile tubes. The kit comes with 15 nice ones and then kind of a cruddy one that doesn't fit together very well. But this one was designed to be spring-loaded and you know you, you push the button and the Polaris missile flies out. <clears throat> of course these days we we wouldn't do that. So uh, I had several of these uh, Revell reissues so I stole one of the ballistic missile tubes so I have a total of 16 and discarded this piece here. The, uh, the top and bottom for the ballistic missiles um, has an opening here and here. This is the top and uh, you know when you push the button this flips open and the missile flies out. So uh, I filled this in with two discs that I made that were twenty thousandths each and uh, what, that, what that did was uh, it gave me a nice ridge to set uh, the replacement missile tube on. On this one I glued it in place and there was a void here and a void on the bottom and I filled those in with some evergreen strip stock, super glued the surfaces and then sanded them smooth and they came out pretty good. Because of the age of the kit uh, you're gonna find that some of the detail surfaces have dimples and mold punch outs for the dimples, there's not a whole lot you can do, so uh, what I did was I covered the dimples with uh, small pieces of plastic. Once these are painted, you won't you won't really be able to see the difference. They'll look like they're they're part of the interior. <clears throat> the round the uh, the round punch outs. I took my water and punch and made tiny punch outs to cover up these these uh, indentations because they'd be really hard to fix and you'd probably ruin the part. So uh, that's how I kind of 
hid these these flaws. On the uh, bulkhead for the torpedo room, this piece can be glued in. There's actually a piece that, that sits here and then a bulkhead here. But this piece, the instructions say you have to glue this all together, but you don't. I checked it, and you can glue this bulkhead in place and then slip the, the other assembly onto it. So what I did was I took some 1 8 inch tubing and added, glued it to the back here because there's a little bit of space where it sits on the, uh, here I'll show you, right now. So this fits right in here. I have to turn it a little bit. And you can see a little bit of space, so what I did was I glued those tubes in place to give it some quasi-realism. And uh, that came out real well. The uh, stand, <clears throat> the instructions have you attach the, the open side of the submarine to here so that it's hinged. The problem is, it doesn't, it, if you do that, you can't fix these seams very well without damaging the, the hull. So what I did was I cut off the hinges here and just added 20 thousandths plastic on both sides here so that you can just slide it in place and friction holds it. Of course those, these I'll put tiny drops of super glue here to hold it in place so it won't flop around but that fixed that problem and that worked out really really well and it allowed me to fix these seams uh, you can see on the underside there's a lot of super glue that I used to make this really really strong because it's the stand <clears throat> on the side of the submarine that's got all of the interior parts to it I glued the nose piece on and uh, there's there's kind of a cup here and if you put the glue on the inside of the nose piece and slide the cup to it, the glue will slide onto the inside so that none of it comes out. And then um, what I did was I put some tape here so that I could position it. And I used testers uh, glue to initially position this piece as well as this piece back here. And then uh, once it was dry, uh, I ran a bead of super glue along here. And followed my same procedure of sanding and scraping and checking it with silver paint. It took three applications, but it came out pretty good. On the stern, uh, the aft section, what I did was I, before I attached it to the hull, I glued these two pieces together. And uh, there's some parts in, inside here so that the, the, the rudders and elevators would just kind of slip into place. Um, and then once I completed all the seam work here, then I, I followed the same procedure, used some testers to uh, glue it in place so that I could adjust it, put some tape here, and then once it was dry, again, I put a bead of super glue here, and again, it took, I think, three applications to fix it. On the top of the missile silo section, it fits against the hull fairly tightly, except you've got a void here of about 20,000, so before you glue this onto the hull, you put, need to put a strip back here, this 20,000 strip, so that it, it closes up this void. And then what you do is you position it up here first, put a few tiny drops of super glue here to hold it, and then work your way down carefully and position the part and put some more tiny drops of super glue along the seam line. It's a fairly tight fit, but if, you were, if you're careful and follow the procedure that I just outlined and work your way down here, you can get a nice tight level fit. And then um, it's a, there's a tiny bit of an opening down here, and it only took one layer of super glue across the entire top, which I applied very carefully, keeping the super glue away from this nice raised detail on the missile silos. And then I carefully scraped and sanded it smooth and then polished it with a steel wool pad. So it came out really, really nice. So now <clears throat> everything will just kind of slide into place and I don't have to worry about seeing any, any voids here. Uh, one other thing, oh, let me mention to you on the, uh, the propeller, I glued uh, the prop in place, or the, the shaft in place, cut off the end so that I could just slide the propeller on here. And then there was a mole punch out right in here, 
and I used my water and punch to uh, it was a 0 0.015 inch thick disc super glued it in place and sanded it smooth so that took care of that problem so that kind of a general explanation of the changes that I made to this kit to really improve its appearance the next step is to go ahead and prime everything start my finished painting Thanks for watching part one of our four part series of building the Ravel 1 to 200 scale USS George Washington, an old reissue of an original Renoir kit from the 1960s. And stay tuned for part two, which is coming up next. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. And when you get the chance, visit our website at www.mikeashy.com, where you're going to find dozens of free PDF downloads, including tutorials, picture references, model galleries, projects, and my five original scale modeling books. Thanks to Ben Sound and Vidivo for the royalty-free music, and happy scale modeling!